Ah, you, you can record now. Okay. Yes, everything so works. So I don't know how, but we we manage. So I start the recording. Okay. So. So let us call it Donaldson with the view on topological sigma model. So actually, okay, so actually the history was the following. <clears throat> The first person who seriously did the topological theory were, was Donaldson in his instant on counting. And uh, then Edward Witten borrowed his ideas and uh, did uh, similar things in, for sigma models. So the history was not from dimension two to dimension four. The actual history was from dimension four to dimension two. So, by the way, Edward Witten was uh, in kind of a hurry at that moment, and uh, he was trying to get the result and the results, and he missed several important points after introducing the subject. And uh, what I'll try to do. Uh, I'll try to fix this point. Why this story is important? It's because this story is a proper introduction to the four-dimensional mirror. That is also partially done by Edward Witten in what is called the Zyberg Witten solution. So Zyberg Witten solution is a way to compute uh, Donaldson. Donaldson invariance. However, uh, it suffers uh, from the same ambiguity or unclear things that this two-dimensional theory suffers from. And uh, the goal of my talks, actually several talks, would to explain you what is going on. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I will start today by considering an important example. This example is simple. However, uh, it is this clear example where you can see what actually is going on. Namely, I will consider Sigma models. And these sigma models that I would like to consider would be the maps from CP1 to CPM. So I'll have a lot of projective spaces today. So let me remind you that CPM is C to the N divided by C. So really CN plus one divided by C star. <clears throat> so what I will need, point one, I will need to see the cohomology of CPM. And I will have two descriptions. Description A is so called 
differential geometrical. And point B would be enumerative geometry. So actually there are, so when we say geometry, we could mean different things. When we speak about differential geometry, we speak about uh, smooth manifolds and some structures in the tan tangent bundle, basically like uh, vector fields, uh, metric, uh, differential forms, etc. So it's differential geometry point of view of the world, or you may call it analysis or analytics. There is also another geometry. And this geometry, geometry that I call point B is, uh, it is about figures. how many figures there are and generally how do how do they intersect okay and i will start by describing these two points of view on cohomology of cpm then I will study the holomorphic maps and the question would be how many holomorphic maps there are. And I will study this from the point of view A and the, from the point of view B. And third, I will study that's called Donaldson Witten construction. And we will uh, discuss freckles. So, freckles. Uh, it's a name that was introduced by me and uh, Nikita Nikrasov. Later, I'll explain why this name is important. Uh, by, so it was called quasi-maps by Dmitry. And uh, if I will have time today, I'll be able to describe the form equals three plus one puzzle. Okay. So I call it like this. So, so it's easy to to see this puzzle and uh, why it's called four equals three plus one. It is because there is a problem where the actual where the actual solution should be one. But when you naively compute, you, you will get four. So there is a difference between four and one. And, uh, and this discrepancy puzzled people in the 90s. However, uh, this discrepancy, namely three, is explained by Freckles phenomenon. And uh, this story is important to understand uh, before we will do something more serious. Okay. Uh, so it's my plan for today. And tomorrow I'll continue from the place where I stopped today. <laughs> Thank you.
So uh, coordinates here, I will call phi zero, phi phi n. So this is homogeneous coordinates on C n plus one. <clears throat> so first, let me study cohomology of uh, C P n. So C P n is a Keller manifold. And it has a Keller form. So called Fubini Studi form. And this is this form is D D bar. So this is a formula. So it's important to note that Fubini Studi form is it is S U M plus one invariant. So in the simplest case, n equals to one. It is SU2 in value. So, since for n equals 2, CP1 is S2 and SU2 is up to center, SO3, it means that this form for the case n equals to 1 is. A round matrix. So, as you know, on the Keller manifold, whenever you have a differential form, you also have a matrix. It corresponds to the round matrix. So, by the way, how can we see that uh, it corresponds to the round matrix? <clears throat> Actually, I would say that locally, when phi not tilde is not equal to zero, we can use this homogeneous coordinate homogeneous coordinates, and uh, this is like dd bar of log phi not square plus sum from i from one to n phi tilde i square. And the action of s u n plus one on the factor comes uh, from the action of s u n plus one on C n plus one. And what we see here is just uh, the metric on C n plus one. And that's why this thing is clearly invariant with respect to S u n plus one. However, this thing is not homogeneous. It does not, it does not go to the C star factor. That's why we can divide. So this is a hint to see that this object is exactly there, SU1 plus N 
round matrix. It's, it's a FU n plus one invariant. Differential form and the uh, corresponding metric is invariant. If I'd like to write it down uh, in formulas, it will be a more complicated expression. So I prefer to put it this way. For n equals to one, omega is And this is the expression that you may see in all textbooks. For Vinish studio or uh, round Keller matrix. Okay. You see this uh, for Vinish studio matrix corresponds to some class in the second cohomology of CPM. So it is possible to multiply Fubinich 2D by itself. It would give some class in the fourth cohomology of CPM, etc. Until you multiply it, until you take Fubinich 2D to the power M. So this belongs to the 2N cohomology of CPM. And it's possible to integrate. And of course, it's interesting to know what, what is the result. And the result is up to some normalization, not uh, some strange number. The, this integral is roughly speaking as well. So how do we describe uh, uh, this situation? We describe the situation saying that cohomology ring of CPM has one generator. The telco sigma. So it is a form by one, sigma, etc., sigma n. And also there is an integration method. So integration map, okay. complex number. And this integration map takes sigma n to one. So, but it takes sigma k to zero for k less than n. So this could be summarized by a simple residue formula.
And, and I will say that it's called instanton equals to zero. Later, I'll explain this notation. So we have several polynomials in sigma. And you just multiply them. And this, this is to me, this means that it's a range. Then, <clears throat> if the degree of what happens is less than m, then, it, then the answer is zero. And it's, it's actually because uh, <coughs> if you have the power of sigma less than m, the residue is zero. However, when you get here sigma to the power n, you have a residue. And the answer is one. And when you have sigma to the power k, where k is greater than n, the answer is zero again. So I advocate this nice formula. Moreover, later, we will have uh, another derivation of this formula from localization, okay? And uh, equivalent integral. But I want uh, to get you acquainted to this type of formula from the very beginning. Now, how do I know that integral of Fubini's 2D to the power n of a CPM is one and say not square root of two? Okay, so uh, I, I, you see. I will miss something like one of one of a two pi i. I just need to know that there is no square root of two or something else appearing here. It is because I have a second description. Of cohomology of CPM. And this description is geometrical in the second sense. Once again, I'll write this formula. The CPM is c to the power n plus one over c. And let me recall you what is the hyperplane. Hyperplane is as follows. Consider hyperplane H star in C n plus one. So what is the hyperplane? It's a solution of equations alpha naught phi naught tilde plus plus alpha n phi and tilde equals to zero. So this is the hyperplane in C n plus one. <clears throat> now I call it H tilde. H tilde is invariant under C star action. Because equation is homogeneous. So H that belongs to CPM is a quotient of this guy by C star. Okay, so 
So, so that's why we have this age that depends on L. Hyperplane. <coughs> By the way, example. For CP1, the hyperplane star is alpha naught fin phi naught plus alpha one phi one equal to zero. It's a line in C square. So hyperplane is a line, while hyperplane tilde is what? Donald, what is hyperplane tilde? Hmm? If you are here. Yes, I'm here. But sorry, H tilde is the line, right? Yes. Then H, so we just. H, H is the line. So this is the equation of the line. Alpha not phi not. Alpha one phi one. Yes. Okay. But sorry, I, I got confused. So H, H so tilde is here. defined by well, alpha zero phi zero tilde phi plus zero alpha one plus phi. Alpha one phi one. Yes, so now to get to H, we just quotient by the C's direction. Yes, so uh, just, so sorry, uh, so sorry, H tilde. So H tilde is a line, so, so it's, so I can feel. So this is a line, right? Yes. So then what is H? A point. It's a point, great. You see, I actually will ask you, I'm sorry, Donald, for asking you, but I don't no want to lose the audience, okay? Even what I'm saying is elementary, uh, still the contact with the audience is kind of important for me. So now consider CP2. So we have alpha naught, Phi not tilde plus alpha one phi one tilde plus alpha two phi two tilde. So H tilde is definitely is a plane, right? So H is what? You see plane, so it is. It's what you study in uh, linear algebra. It's a triple that is orthogonal to the vector. Okay. It's called a plane. So what is H? So what happens if you take, if you factorize plane by this transformation, by projected transformation, by rescale? So Donald, I'm trying to understand what stops you. Oh, um, because I need to, to keep contact with the... Of course, of course, sorry, I'm just thinking. So it's a circle. So, so this is something two dimensional, it's a plane, yes? Sure. So now we factorize by C star. So uh, actually, Donald, it's not your fault, of course. It's a fault of educational system. What I'm telling you, is so obvious, so simple. 
that this has to be studied uh, in the first year of university or in advanced high school. So actually, the fact that this is a plane is studied in the high school, at least in Russia and uh, in China and in other places. But what they forget to study is that this is a homogeneous equation. And it's very important to quotient it by, by the space of non-zero elements of the field. So it's called projective geometry. This projective geometry was discovered by the great mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 70th century in Europe called Dizan. Because he invented projective geometry. Actually, he invented projective ge geometry without knowing coordinates. So he was, uh, he, he lived at the same time as Descartes, Basley. And he explained all this uh, geometrically without coordinates. Now we can use Descartes approach. And now it's very easy. But it was 300 years, uh, 400, almost 400 years ago. So if this is a plane and we divide, I think it's clear that what we have is a line. Okay. It's called a projective line. At least here we have something two dimensional. So when we divide by C star, we get something one dimensional. Is it also a CP1? Andre? Yes? Is it also a CP1, right? You mean the factor? Uh, H, yes. H, yes, of course. But projective line is CP1. Yes, OK. Of course. So how we so how we write this age? We just imagine that CP2 is C, C square joined by CP1 at infinity. So this age is this. Okay, and it goes to infinity. You see, of course, here I here I'm writing c square, but I cannot write c draw c square. I am drawing r square, but you need to imagine that it is like c square. Now, oh, it's interesting. What is H wedge H intersect with H? So if I have two alphas, thing intersects itself, and it's not clear what it is. However, if I consider H alpha prime, and H alpha. I will have the unique intersection point.
and uh, will they intersect at infinity also okay so for let us see mm -hmm. so uh, in order to see uh, how many intersection points do, do we have we need uh, to study well, we need to study it in, in the projective way okay If you study it in a projective way, you see that intersection of uh, of two planes in uh, CQ is a line, right? And then if you study it projectively, you see that line is a point. And now the question is, do they intersect at infinity? Good question. Alex, was it you who asked this question? Yes. It's a good question. So would infinity be a point? We would say that they would intersect. However, infinity is CP1. It means that infinity is a point together with a direction. And since they have different directions, they do not intersect with infinity. So would there be would it be a point? It would be not CP2. It would be the sphere. Okay. So, CP, so when things go to infinity, they remember the direction. That's why they do not intersect at infinity. Okay? It's good that you are asking this question. Okay. So, by the way, this is the geometric intersection theory. Now, you may ask, how geometric intersectional theory is related to multiplication and integration of differential forms? Okay? And uh, the relation is as follows. Suppose you have a figure that I call phi, you see, figure. You can consider so called delta function on the figure. This is singular differential form. The simplest example of this singular differential form is delta function of a point on, uh, say, on R1. Example. Uh, so if you want to get the tedious uh, and a bit dull, but absolutely clear explanation of these delta functions, I would recommend you the book what to that is even translated into Russian. I think it's translated into many languages. It's called differential forms and their applications. I think in topology. So they spent like 10 or 15 pages explaining how to D singular D singularize this form, and I will call this epsilon. But it is very silly 
to study these mathematical constructions in detail. So I'll uh, give you a picture of what is going on. Suppose we have a line R. Suppose we have a point P. And coordinate is x equal to zero. So then I can write down the regularized delta function. So it is a one point. When epsilon is going to zero, it is exactly delta function. Now, what if we have a point in C? The formula would be very similar. I put here epsilon. You see, understanding of this formula is uh, what uh, what is basic in understanding of what uh, enumerating geometry is, what instantonic theories are. So it is a zero dimensional example. Now, let us play with these examples a bit. Suppose we have R2. What is delta function on the line? Let us describe the line alpha by equation x one alpha one plus alpha two x two equal to zero. Okay. And I call this F alpha, okay? Where alpha is a pair of two numbers. Then I can write regularized delta function that I'll call alpha. That is, E minus F alpha moduli square D F alpha. Okay. Sorry, not exactly. Square root of epsilon, epsilon. Now, let me consider everything with the primes. I hope that resolution is good enough, so, uh, such that you can see primes. F alpha prime modulate square. D F alpha prime. Epsilon, square root of epsilon. Okay. Now, this delta epsilons are differential form. Okay. They are smooth differential form. They are integrable differential forms on R2. 
So, I may ask, what would happen if I take a wedge product? and integrate over R2. And could you guess the answer? The answer would be one. And then how do we see this answer? So here we have R2. So here is the alpha line. So here is the alpha prime line. Now, let us see where is the approximate support of this product. So this is the street where we have approximate support of delta epsilon. And the width of this street is what? It's like one over the width is of course the square root of epsilon. Because of this factor. So when when exponent is like one half or one third, it means that we are over. Later on, exponent fall, falls fast enough. So it is actually the region where we have this. The same for the second element of the product. And here the width is square root of epsilon prime. So it means that the product is concentrated here. So the product is concentrated around the intersection point. Okay. And approximately what we have here, intersection point, and something like a square or parallelogram of the area about square root of epsilon, square root of delta of epsilon prime. And we actually, we are roughly speaking taking the shape, the, the, the taking this area. However, we have this factors. Downstairs. And they cancel the fact that the area is small. So actually, this product is like delta function with some epsilon tilde regularization of what? Of a point of intersection. So it is interesting that this construction of smoothening Delta function tells you that external multiplication that we studied above goes into intersection thing. So this is a qualitative way to see this.
However, there is also a resource way to see this. Because we go to R2, and then we can say that let F alpha be a new coordinate. X tilde one. Let F alpha prime be a new coordinate. X tilde two. Then in this new coordinate, I can rewrite everything like this. Okay, let me call it X tilde and this X tilde prime. I'm sorry. And now you can compute this integral and see that it's actually one. So this is an example that shows how smooth the delta functions are related to intersectional theory. By the way, we can modify our example. So, Andre. Yes. There is factor of two pi, right, or something like yes. that. Yes. So I, uh, you see, I, I, of course, there are factor of two pi is everywhere. Actually, the square of two pi, or right. square of pi. Yes, of course. So uh, if I, uh, you see, I can use my mind to remember all these factors and tools, but then I'll forget something more important, okay? You said so it was important what? that there is not square root of two, and so. Okay, yes, you, 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 you need to, <laughs> yes, you, you, you need to remember all this, all these tools and files, you see, but, this is the illustration of the idea, and it actually works. And uh, it's possible to, to recover this two and pi. Now, now let, let me do something else. Let me instead compute intersection of a line, not with a line. but with uh, something quadratic. So how would I do this? So I'll uh, have F alpha and F A. So F alpha would be again alpha one X one plus alpha two X two. What could be F A? F A, so let it be quadric. A one X one squared plus A two X one X two plus a three x two squared so geometrically geometrically <coughs> I will call this a figure. And I can draw it somehow. So a figure could be 
it could be this. As we know, a figure could be this or this, yes? And let, let me write the same formula. I'll call it epsilon r. And uh, and it is interesting to see what would be a result. Mm -hmm. Doing similar things, you may see that result comes from two regions of intersection. Okay. From this region and from this region. So it is interesting to see. What would happen We will definitely have two contributions, but uh, what would be is that these two contributions could come either with the same sign or with an opposite sign. So uh, let me leave it to you as an exercise to guess, would these signs be the same or different? You see, I, I skipped something because you know, <laughs> when you change equations, Interesting things can happen. In particular, just assume that uh, a one is one, a three is one. You see, it's it, so. I, what I'm trying to say is, it's possible to play here with signs. You may ask, uh, could it be that these two signs would be one? Would there be the same size or different size? Actually, I can take this line and, may, and maybe deform it such that I can go away from the circle. So actually, I need to study this science here. However, there is, an, uh, there is an issue where uh, I definitely know that uh, when you do intersectional theory, you always have uh, proper signs. It is when you go to complex field in complex numbers. Z 
Then I have to write down similar picture, but not on R2, but on C, but on C square. Okay. So when I write it on C square, there is a epsilon, delta epsilon. So that corresponds to figure. It is e to the minus equation, once again moduli over epsilon. Here I need to write df, df bar. And here I have not a square root of epsilon, but epsilon. And if I study this, and when I multiply them, I see that contributions come from the region. Where both f alpha equals to zero and f a equals to zero. So it is called the intersection. And <clears throat> while in real numbers, for the example, consider the intersection could be nothing, point, or two points. So we know it. Here, there is the main theorem of algebra that says that intersection is always two points. Okay. And since the complex structure determines you orientation, you may see that points are computed Without signs, points are computed always with the sign one. So, in complex numbers, I can consider F of degree D. And I can play the same game here. So, F. A of degree D equals to zero and F alpha equals to zero. That this system has D solution. And that's why this integral is always D. So these absolute games is a bridge. between analytic geometry and enumerated. It means that you can compute the integer number by taking smooth integral. <clears throat> Sorry, Andre, do you have to now you want epsilons, not square root of epsilon. Sorry? In the integrant, now Sorry, you have say? square root of epsilon, right? 
You want have some? Yes. Now, now, of course. You see, I started modifying formulas, and thank you. So uh, my goal is to show you these epsilon games on an example. Now, how can you prove the so-called main theorem of algebra? It's one thousand and first proof. You can do it like this. You consider f i d. So let me play with d equals two. A zero phi one squared plus a one phi one phi two plus a three phi two cubed to the square. Sorry. I want to compute this number for general a zero, a one, and a and a two. I may check that nothing depends on a. You may check it using analytically. Now it means that uh, that uh, I can choose my favorite A's. So my favorite A's would be phi one plus K phi two squared F A. Or, or even better, K one. So, <clears throat> so the space of zeros could be two plane, two lines. Then, for I can also deform F alpha. And this is how I how I see that the number of points is two. I can play it in the d-dimensional. No, for a d, phi one minus k one, etc. K d, phi two. It is one of the way to prove that the number of roots is d. But my goal is not the main theorem of algebra. My goal here is, is the tool how we proved it. I am teaching you the epsilon games, OK? You see, it is the case where the lemma is more important than its consequences. By the way, we need to make what? We need to make a break. Okay? We need to make a five minutes break. Thank you. 
Okay, I am back. So let us continue. So now let me come back to the cohomology ring of CPM. I have the following class. Okay? I have the following class. And what is interesting is that this class is equivalent 
to the class of Fubini study form. Then the question would be how to get it. Why do I know this? Let me explain it in one dimensional example. So actually, there are many ways to show it, but uh, I will show it. by the very particular trick. F for being student is DD bar of what? Of, once again, of log phi tilde one phi tilde zero squared plus phi tilde n phi tilde zero. So what does it mean? It means that omega fuguni fuguni studi is exact outside the region where phi zero equals to zero. So phi zero equals to zero tilde is a hyperplane okay so omega for being studi roughly speaking is something exact plus something that sits on the hyperplane. Phi zero tilde equal to zero. So how do I see it? I can replace this log by log epsilon. So this log epsilon would be this log everywhere is modified near phi zero equal to zero. Line. So this is the exact part. And there is also a part sitting at phi zero till the equal to zero. Okay, that's why <clears throat> so, so what I have not shown to you show right now, I have not shown to you. So I have shown that uh, omega for being study could be deformed to the differential form with the support. As this type of play, I have not shown you that the coefficient of, of proportionality is one, but uh, I want to show, show you this idea. Okay. Now, what happens if I consider this? I will get something like delta on H1 intersected with H2, etc. 
So, delta epsilon one, H one, intersected or multiplied by delta epsilon two, H two. You see, I called here one and two just to show that I consider a different hyperplane. Delta epsilon n h n is equivalent to some delta epsilon, and here I have intersection. But you can check that these hyperplanes in general position intersect at point. And then I have delta epsilon at some point of intersection and I integrate over CPM and I get one. You see here I show you again the inter uh, intersection theory and the integral over the of the product of differential points. Okay. So after these preliminaries of intersectional theory on CPM, let me do the following. Let me study holomorphic maps from CP1 to CPM. And what is good is that I can give you an explicit description of these maps. So here I'll pick up coordinates Z0, Z1. And here, of course, I pick up coordinates phi zero, phi m. So I'd like to write phi i tilde as a function f i of z naught Z1. I would like, I would like to recall that CPN is C n plus one over C star. So would I take an arbitrary function? It would give me, it would, it would give me map to C n plus one. But I want to have a map to C n plus one over C star. So what does it mean? It would mean that uh, I would like to have a symmetry. So how can I achieve this system symmetry? I can achieve it as the following way. Point A. I would like to ask the degree of Fi equal to D for all i from zero to n. What does it actually mean? F A P P Z one D minus P and here I take a sum from P equal to zero to 
Guy. So if I have these FIs, I would actually have a map. C square to C n plus one such that the action C star acting here are equivalently concerned. It would mean that, that if I mul multiply, if ZA is going to lambda ZA, then phi tilde go to lambda to the power d phi tilde. So if I have such polynomials, I claim, claim that such polynomials define And I will say almost, and I will explain why. A map from CP1 to CPL. <laughs> How do I know it? Let me reason in a geometrical way. I would like to have a map between line in CP1 to line in CPF. So CP1 is made out of lines. CPN is also made out of lines. So So I take the vector V along this line. And I get a vector V capital. F and So this vector V, so if I have a line, I can have, I can have different choices of vector V. So let me change vector V small here. So if I go from vector V to lambda V, the vector V capital goes to lambda D V capital, but this, while this is different vector, it determines the same line in CPM. That's why homogeneous polynomials of degree D is exactly what I need. So would, there be, would these guys be Non-homogeneous. The resulting vector would differ not by a constant factor, but by some function of z. And I will not get a map. Okay, so that's what determines the map. Now, 
I need to explain this important thing that is called Olbo. So what is, you see, in Harry Potter, there was almost headless somebody, <laughs> almost headless Nick, as far as I remember. How could be? How could you be almost headless? Or how? What does it mean to define almost define the man? Answer is like this. Imagine. that f takes a vector v that the image of the small vector v is zero mm. zero vector zero vector does not determine a line in the n plus one dimensional space so if f of v is zero vector, you just miss. It. You do not have a map into CPM. Is not a map. And Greenfield called it quasi map. In other terms, it means that here we have C n plus one. And you need to take out zero before you divide by six stuff. But if you land at zero, you are missing here. So it is bad luck, bad luck. So these are quasi maps. So, what what could we say about these quasi-maps? Space of quasi-maps. They are completely de determined by the matrices A, I, P. So they belong to C, complex numbers. So how many numbers do we have here? I goes from zero to N. So here we have N plus one. P goes from zero to So here we have d plus one. So all together we have n plus one, d plus one numbers. So they form c n plus one, d plus one. However, If A I P go to lambda A I P, it is the same map. Because remember, that small vector V then maps to lambda vector V. And this lambda is what and for all. And this is actually the same map because things are going to the same line all over the space. So the space of quasi maps is actually this. Okay, I can subtract zero here. So zero is definitely trivial thing. And I divide it by C star. So space of quasi maps is CP n plus one 
d plus 1 minus 1. You see, I made all these computations in order to show you that uh, I will, we will have projective spaces and uh, intersection theory on projective uh, spaces all the way around. The world sheet is a projective space. The target space is a projective space. Even the space of quasi maps is a projective space. And I told you that uh, intersectional theory on projective spaces is simple, okay, and doable. So that's why this is an example when you when you cannot only formulate theory that something exists. It's an example where you have ability or should have an ability to compute everything. Everything is explicit. Fubini study form is explicit. Uh, hyperplanes are explicit. Intersections of hyperplanes are explicit. So it is the most explicit uh, thing in analysis. So what people propose to do? Take a space of quasi maps. And multiply it by several CPUs. Then, what you can do? You can evaluate quasi map at point Z. So let me put here these. Okay, I will call them P. P1, PK. So there is a map called evaluation. I am evaluating quasi map at point uh, PI. And I go to CPM. So what I'm actually doing, I have these formulas with A and I substitute here. Z1, Z1 of PI, Z0, sorry, start with Z0 of PI, Z1 of PI. Okay, here I have this F. Okay, I'll call them A, index A here. FI, so it depends on A. And I understand this as a line in CP1. So this connection belongs to CPM. In which case I can do it. If it, it is a map and not a quasi map. So oh, how to understand this difference between maps and quasi maps? So FIs are polynomials. So quasi maps 
R is the following situation where F I equals F I with the head. And here we have the common multiplier that I'll write down in the following way Z1 minus. B one Z zero for all I so let us see how different are quasi maps from maps. So how to, how to find, how to define the dimension of quasi mass? It's clearly the dimension of one. So it is quasi map of degree D minus one, yes? And also B one. And this is number B1. So what is the meaning of this number B1? Number B1 has the following meaning. It's the target CP1. It's a position of point on source. Where quasi map is not is not a map because when z one over z zero equals b one, all these f's go to zero, and it is not a map into CPM. It is something else. So dimension of such space is n plus one d. You see, I take minus out plus one plus one. So this plus one is this b one. So. So call dimension of, okay, I will call them freckles. In quasi maps is N plus one, it's a call dimension. Because of this factor, you see, I do, I drop one d minus one. It is m. So what does it mean that co dimension is m? It means that for CP one as a target, it is a divisor. For CPM, it has even higher dimension. However, now we have an interesting, peculiar thing. We may ask. What if 
and capital formally equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Does it have any meaning? Yes, it has a meaning. It means that I is zero. So naively, C over C star, and I want to consider C minus zero over C star is a point. So the only maps to a point are uh, constant maps to a point. However, if I consider quasi maps, n equals zero mean what? Means that co-dimension of freckles is zero, you see. So it means that everything are freckles. So what does it mean that everything are fractal? It means that the map is given by F0. That is some constant Z1 minus B Z0, Z1 minus B, B2, Z0, Zy minus BD, Z0. So this is a degree D quasi map. It is not a map. Because it is not defined at points B1, B2, BD. So such thing is not a map. But this is a quasi map. And the moduli of such quasi maps are the position of these things that we call freckles. Okay. Here, everything is made out of freckles. For, for n capital equals, equals to one, freckles are in complex co dimension one, etc. Now, Now, once again, let me study quasi map minus record times CP1, CP1, K times, and I have a map into CPM. I have not only one map, I have FA, I have K maps. So I call this F. So I take F and I substitute here. A 
point. So here I put Z1 of PA, Z0 of PA. So So I consider some CP1 that is uh, labeled by A. So here A runs from one to K. So I take K, I take K CP1. So the point PA on the case on the A CP1 has coordinate Z1, Z0. I take this thing. So uh, this is a coordinate of uh, a point in CPM. So this is my explicit description of what I call evaluation method. Then let me do the following. Let me take omega that belongs to cohomology of CPM. I will take omega one and also omega a. Uh, omega k. So I take k elements. Cohomology of CPM. Represent, I will represent them by differential forms. Then I will take evaluation A. I evaluate it at point P. And I take a pullback. I take a pullback here on this thing. I take a product from A equals one to K, and I'd like to integrate over quasi map minus reckless. And this is what I call, okay, quasi map have index D. I put it here. I take a sum from D equals from zero to infinity. And I weight it with this. And I will call this quantum correlator of O zero of omega one, O zero of omega K. And I say that they depend on Q. So this is an object that I'm going to study. Maybe it's better in order to avoid confusion, call it capital omegas. In order not to mix them with the Fubini studio omega. And this thing is called quantum cohomology ring. So let us see, could I write down a formula? So omega A 
is actually a polynomial of the Fubini student form. So what I have here, well, so what do I have here? <clears throat> I have here some operation on polynomial. So actually, I am taking the, the set of polynomials, P1, Pk, and I would like to get here a function of Q. Actually, a formal series. So that's what I'm going to find. So what, what do I know? I know that for k equals to zero, I know this. Because for k equals to zero, Map. So what does it mean q equals to zero? It means that I study only d equals to zero maps. So, so these quasi maps are nothing but constants f naught f m. Okay. So these, these, so these are constant maps, so quasi maps for d equals to zero are points on CPM. So actually, for d equals to zero, here I get just integral of. Uh, this differential forms omega one omega k over CPM, and I already and I already know this. So that for I know that for q equals to zero, it is nothing but p one of sigma, p k of sigma, divided by sigma n plus one, the integral of sigma. So I am interested to know how this thing is changing when I have this cube. By the way, this nice formula says that when I have here sigma, where here altogether sigma is lower than 10 plus one, the answer is zero. When sigma altogether is higher than n, I mean the total degree, the answer is zero. Only sigma to the n gives a contribution. So here we already have this ring structure and this formula. I would like to say that here I would I also I would also have a ring structure. And there are several ways to prove this ring structure. So today I am explaining things from the purely mathematical side. So that's why let me first compute it. It's interesting that this thing could be explicitly computed. Okay, how do I compute it? I am computing it in the following way. Since I am integrating over the quasi maps, okay, and quasi maps are projective space. 
I need to understand what? I need to understand what is the class of this E. So in order to compute, I need to find class of if a omega a in cohomology of cp n plus one d plus one minus one. So these are quasi maps. And then I need to check that if I have a top class, I could ignore freckles. Okay. But sorry, Andre, because, there is something... because freckles are in half, because freckles are in co dimension. Okay. But sorry, Andre, there's something I don't but, understand. So this please. pullback. So the pullback of omega a, right? So it lives not only on quasi maps, but on quasi maps times another CP1, right? Here, here I intentionally put zero. So it okay. means that I consider it as a zero form on CP1. Right. Because at the moment, you see, it's already in notation. Mm -hmm. I consider it as a parameter. That, that, that speaks to some number. Mm -hmm. And this is hidden when I say zero. OK, I see. So now, the tricky thing is how to compute <coughs> what is going on? Or is it possible to integrate? So how to integrate? So actually, to do this, so one of the ways to proceed is to say one of the ways. Let us take some representatives, okay, and pull them back. And uh, we just need to be sure that uh, freckles are not a problem, that freckles are not mixed in the computation. Because you may say that this space, space when you take out freckles, is not this space. So the main question is, could I ignore freckles in the computation or not? And if I can ignore freckles, then what is the, what is the procedure? I cannot be very easy with this. Still, still, there is a way to say when I can go Ignoring freckles. Okay. In order to, to show how can I ignore freckles, I will take special representatives here. So I describe to you all these representatives, especially to show 
that uh, you may pick up representatives such that Rachel do not interfere. Okay? So what are these representatives? Take omega A. B products. Okay, when I say omega A's, I would like to say I have omega for Bini Studi on the target to the power KA. So I have a point A that goes from one to K, yes? Uh, maybe L, I'll put here L or N. So at A's point, I take Omega Fubini Studio to the power NA represented as what? As delta function on the product of NA hyperplanes. Etc. Delta epsilon and a. So here I take intersection of n plus a hyperplane. Okay. Then. Then let me see what would I have on the space of, of quasi maps. On the space of quasi maps, I want to say the following that when I evaluate and pull back. I also have delta function on a hyperplane on, on a product of hyperplanes inside quasi maps. Let me let me tell you why. What is it? The delta function is delta form, sorry. On the space of solution to the following equation. Look, AI. P, okay. Z not at P A. Okay, let me put here power Q uh, Q L M. Z one D minus M.
what is the index here? J. So I need to explain this for you. Here I have a sum of them. This is the map Fi evaluated as a point PA. It has to go to the intersection of H1, H2, etc. H and A. To the intersection of the hyper hyperplane. How do I write it? I write this Fi and then I substitute it in equations to this hyperplane. But they are, of course, linear equations. Alpha i j, j goes from one to an a are linear equations. For omega Fubini two DNA, written here. So altogether, I have this system of equation. J is going from uh, one to an A. And I have this equation for all A going from one to K. So here, this is a huge system of equation. However, what is important? All of them are linear. Because these are just coefficients. And this is the coefficient. And the only variable is this capital A that enters linear. But it's exactly the case that we started at the beginning. This space of equations is the uh, intersection of hyperplanes. And the, if the dimension is proper, they finally intersect by a line in the space with coordinates A, or by a point in the space of quasimodes. So this product is just intersection of hyperplanes in the space of quasimers. So answer is one. Moreover, it is clear that I can always choose a representative such that this intersection happens outside the fractal submanifold. Because you see, I have hyperplanes and I can move them uh, actually freely. So I can always exclude quasimers. OK? So that's why this uh, number could be computed. You see, I do not need to solve these equations for these P's and for these alphas. The number of solutions is independent. And that means that I have this map. So I can compute it on sigma to the power n1, sigma to the power n k. So 
of this equals to one if what? If the mindset go right, if L1 plus, ah, sorry, of course it goes, it goes to Q to the power D. So it's contribution uh, from, the, from the degree D. If N1 plus N2 plus etc. equal to what? Equal to the dimension of this space. D plus one minus one. So this is a result. And I want to say that I obtained this result by purely mathematical arguments. I did not uh, involve the this, uh, this statement is, uh, this statement comes purely from the statement of the fact that if you have CP great L manifold, then uh, you intersect many hyperplanes. So they intersect by a point. And if you can, and if you would like to subtract something, some figure out of it, you can always choose uh, the intersection point here away from, from this figure five. Okay. And that's how I get, so that's how I get this result. Now, <clears throat> so is this result in agreement with what I had before? Of course, yes. So the case D equals zero says that sigma and one Sigma and K equals one if and one plus plus and K equals M. Yes, it's a well known result. Now, what's interesting here is that this is an operation. Actually, this operation has a ring structure. You see, at the moment, it seems that it is an operation that has k inputs. And uh, here we go to complex number. Actually, one can check. That here actually one can check that this operation is as follows there is a commutative associated ring, okay, such that. This operation is obtained in the following way. You have a ring multiplication F and the cumulator of elements that I call N1, MK. Is actually the following F and one and two. 
M. F, M, N3, M prime, etc. F, I don't know how many primes. M, K, M. Okay, I can put here M1, M2. And here I have F. So how many M's do I need? M. K minus two and K. M K minus one. M K minus one. And here I put a sum over M one up to M K minus one. Interesting, you may check. That this, that this operation follows from this procedure. So what does this procedure mean? You multiply two elements, you continue multiplication. And one and two. Here we have M1. Here we have M3. Here we have M2. All the way until you get M K minus one. So first you have this multiplication. And then you evaluate this element. And you may check that these apps were F and one and two M is what? Is So this equals to what? So what, what is this multiplication? Is delta function of N1 plus N2M. So it, it was before plus Q delta function N1 plus N2. So here I need minus N. M. So if n one and n two go to M, it's okay. If n one and n two is greater than n capital, then it's possible to subtract this n capital, and you will get the result. So let me check that I have not mixed. That I didn't make a mistake in this chain. Let me check. Let me check myself. So uh, if I have omega Fubini's two D, when I multiply with another omega Fubini's two D, I would like to get one. So if I have one one here. I want to get zero minus n minus one.
Yes. You may check that this formula are of such form for exactly this multiplication. And you may also check that this, this is definitely a commutative iteration, but it's not clear why it is associated. Why it is associated? The easy explanation why it is associated is to say that look, this multiplication table is nothing but the following multiplication table. You multiply two things, moduli stigma n plus one minus q. So it's so this thing is actually it means that we that we have a ring ring of polynomials and sigma factorized by the ideal let us see have we seen it before? So for q equals zero, this formula exactly means that uh, we have a ring over the ideal sigma n plus one. Because if here we have sigma n plus one, we can divide and our contour integral will definitely be zero. So we see this ring. And actually you may check that the answer is like this. Well, you pick up a contour in a special way. So picking up a contour in a special way, this would give you a result. So now I make a stage. So now, so when people say this, they say, ah, oh, look, we understand what you are talking about. You are talking about Landau Ginsburg model. And superpotential is related to this sigma n plus one. Here we have two q, etc. <coughs> now we will do it. And also there was a question: what happens with the higher observables? What happens with the observables? As you, as you said, where you have uh, integrals over the wall sheet CP1. How this would play. And uh, there will be some puzzles and explanations. And I'll tell, and I'll talk about it tomorrow. So now I actually made a stage, complete stage for my tomorrow's talk, okay? So at the moment, at the moment, everything is beautiful, nice, no problems, great result. You can also, you can even get many heuristic uh, explanations why this sigma to n plus one goes to q. Okay. I but I would like to go to heuristic after I have a mathematical result and not before. Okay. Okay. So that, so that's that's it for today. Any questions?
By the way, you, you, will, you will never get this type of presentation in the literature, as far as I understand. At least I, I, I have never seen it in the literature. So results is not new, but presentation is a bit different and a bit honest. Okay. So I, I spoke uh, up to almost three hours. So it's my stand, it's my standard speaking time. And I uh, respect traditions. If I used to speak this amount of time, all the time, I will do it in future. <coughs> so today's talk would be called good news. Tomorrow I'll speak about bad news. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, see you tomorrow then. I hope I can make it. So let me ask Sam. So is Sam still here? Because He's not Sam here. is quite busy these days. So we so if he left, then it would mean that uh, that we will have probably only European copy. Yes. So I'm stopping the recording now. Yes, but you see, 